Good morning. This is the Eager Beaver Show. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, The Misfy Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, your uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Peppermaster, hot pepper sauces made from farm-fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. Well, good morning, and hello, kids, and welcome to season three and episode number, I have no idea today, <laughs> I'll be totally honest, 357 of the Daily Beaver Morning Show here on the Cryo Media Network. Yeah. Today, recording day is Wednesday, April 10th, 2024. And, uh, well, it looks like it's going to be a mix of cloud and sun here today at the Beaver Lodge. I'm your host, the eager beaver pronouns he, him, hey, Mr. Beaver A. And with me, as always, is my good friend, Mr. Grizzly. A big thank you goes to our podcast founding sponsors, The Pepper Master, The Misfy Mysteries from Corbin Moon Publishing, and CanadianTarot.com. But before we do anything else, Mr. Grizzly. How's your mental health today, sir? Uh, I think it's doing pretty good, actually. Um, took uh, Ms. Lola out for an early morning stroll, and the weather is going to be gorgeous today. I think it's we're hitting 21. Might get a little bit rain later, but uh, when it's a warm, sunny day in the springtime, it always helps lift my spirits, you know? So, yeah, I think the mental health is doing pretty good today. Time will oh. tell. I, mean, I could have a complete crash later on, but, you know, <laughs> starting off good, so... Oh, well, well, I'm, I'm good to hear. And I'm very, very glad to hear that. Uh, and um, I am doing well uh, as well. I'm s starting to feel a little rested uh, mm. after the last uh, four months because <clears throat> they've been uh, very busy for me. Uh, it's kind of weird. Uh it's kind of weird when you're extremely busy to go from extremely busy to just sort of normal schedule uh, over like just a couple of days because mm -hmm. literally, I think it was two and a half weeks ago, I was mm -hmm. working on three shows and in the throes and the curling season of trying to make sure that we qualified for playoffs. And right now as we speak, let's say on the like the 22nd, I was working on three shows and trying to get through that the 22nd and what were like 19 days later. And all of a sudden I only have one show and only I'm in the playoffs and only two of the four curling leagues in which I curl. Mm. So it's a bit of a, an adjustment. It's like a, yes, but it's like a, <sighs> like yesterday evening, um, our, uh, our curling match got, canceled because the team we were playing forfeited because they couldn't field a, or I guess well, I would say field a team, but I guess we could say ice a team, I guess. Uh, <laughs> although I don't know if you want to ice a team. Um, that, yeah, uh, no, that, no. That, that sounds a little mobby. Uh, <laughs> we iced good. the other team. We won the championship. Um, so, uh, and when the news came in that we didn't have to, there was no place I needed to be yesterday evening. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like this big exhale. It's like, I don't have to shower. I don't have to do my hair. I don't have to put on nice clothes. 
I don't have to be social. I don't have to deal with people because I am a little peopled out. Mm. A little, little peopled out. Um, and even last night, uh, my beaver sweetie said, well, we still have some leftovers from Eclipse Day. We can make that or we can go to Swiss Chalet or, well, you know, I have had a hankering for all you can eat sushi and I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, I really don't want to cook, but I really don't want to go out and have to prepare and do everything to be out in public eating <laughs> as well. So I think we'll just stay home. But I actually said no to going out to eat. Me. It's not often. <laughs> so no, I'd rather stay home. Thank you. <laughs> um, very rare occurrence. Indeed. Yes. Um, so I have been uh, very, very, very happy to have nothing to do uh, yesterday. And uh, the last three, four days, I've just been sleeping like crazy and going to bed really early and waking up late and sleeping the full nights and not waking up in the middle. I was exhausted. Mm -hmm. Exhausted. Um, I don't think I could have kept on at that uh, pace for much longer. On the upside... Uh, yesterday, I had my first, well, I was going to say, I can't actually say first tennis of the season because that is not true. Because mm -hmm. three weeks ago, we had a day that was 10 or 12 and I went to play. But uh, I did get to play. And I played against my friend Christian, who is um, uh, as far as I, well, one of the best players at the club hands down and I've been playing them for like four or five years now and the first year I could win a game off them now and then but I haven't won a game even a game off them mm -hmm. two years at all I won a game off them yesterday well first time I really played been. the best tennis of my I was a freak here I lost eight to one mm -hmm. and I was a freaking stud out there <laughs> okay I was smacking the crap. I had never hit the ball that hard. I had winners. Like a shot that came to me and I just hit boom, full force and just landed in and nothing, just standing there and you couldn't do anything a couple of times. Mm -hmm. I never can do that. I guess I cracked three of them in a row at one point yesterday. He just like served it to him. He hit it back to me hard and I just cracked it back hard and all three of them landed and that's how I won my one. I just like bombarded him. And then the next game, I was like one point away from getting the second one. It could have been 8-3. Wow. I came close. I was like within one point of getting two other points. He just blows, he blows me away all the time. So uh, I don't know what happened over the winter because I haven't played once. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if it was just watching a lot of tennis and paying attention or visualizing, like sort of just grabbing my racket and taking swings into the air over like in the living room, just moving stuff around, which I have done a couple of times this winter while I've been watching tennis. Mm -hmm. so I just grab the racket and just try a couple of uh, forehands or, you know, uh, but, uh, whoa, I am a new player. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, it's pretty cool. So uh, I, I've got a couple of tricks that I'm going to keep trying. Uh, and uh, I definitely, I, I figured out at the end of last year that maybe I was just a little too timid on my hits. So I just, I just really went for it. I just cracked the stuffing out of everything I could. And after about like four games, my arm was a little sore. Going, I don't know if I can keep this up for a full set, but I did. Mm -hmm. I actually had the insurance to just keep whacking that. So, um, this is good. Yeah, it's going to be a fun season. Because, listen, I was having fun when I was just playing C-ball, hit ball. But now that I could actually be in rallies and go back and forth and actually, like, make a couple of good ones every now and then, mm -hmm. like, it's, 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 a, like, it's like I'm discovering a new game every time I develop an additional skill. And for a while, it's, I don't even care whether I win or lose. It's just that I'm making great shots and staying in it, and I'm feeling, like, really good because I'm getting much more fun out of it. I'm like sprinting from side to side and digging things and making them go, my God, I can't believe that stayed in. Wow, yay me. As the ball sails by me <laughs> as it comes back, right? <laughs> it's like, wow, I made that. Oh, <laughs> you got, okay. <laughs> That's the one thing in tennis. Never stop running to admire your shots because then you get smoked. Yeah, you're going to get <laughs> You're going to be destroyed. But every now and then it's like, Wow. <laughs> it's like, Never so, get high on your own supply, dude. I know, I know, I know, I know. But at this point, the fact that I hit the ball with power and it stays in is a win. 
Mm. <laughs> so <laughs> it's like, yay, I could finish up a point. <laughs> so um, I'm looking forward to this season. And since I don't have anything else going on, I don't have any plays this summer or anything of the sort. I can actually play tennis all summer rather than having to divide my loyalties. Yay. Nice. Ah, I'm a happy beaver. All right, Good kids. Stuff. There is news. There is news. Uh, I saw in what you put for the episode description. Um, there was a little, uh, yeah, yeah, interesting pee pee moment. And here's the thing, kids. I'm, I'm really, really trying to make this though, not make this the. Oh, look what pee pee yeah. did today. Yeah. Show agreed. Uh, oh my god. Yeah, it's like. We can't ignore it. Uh, we have to, you know, I agree with you. I don't want it to just be about that guy, but my God, it's just a new pile of crap every single damn day. And this one was a doozy. Uh, I have the clip. Uh, okay. <laughs> Kids, the house Cubs, of I apologize in advance for any loss of brain cells people may suffer from having watched this. Mr. Grizzly, please. Here we go. This is, this is yesterday in the House of Commons. I, yeah, I think it was yesterday. Speaker, he met the premiers in 2016. Since that time, he's broken the promise. Well, let's, let's start with the fact that he's lying continually while he's speaking, by the yes. way. Yes, yes. Just... Four JB, lies in a row. JB, yeah, but did the lie counter thing. Yes. He's, he like, he's going to become our Daniel Dale, I think, since the U.S. is not going to give him back, given yeah. that Trump's in the next election. <laughs> Here we go. He said the tax would only go up to 11 cents a liter. Mm. Now, he admits it will go up to 61 cents a liter. He said the tax would make people better off. Now we have the parliamentary budget officer's report, which confirms 60% of Canadians pay more than they get back. The prime minister said, and I quote in 2015, Canadians need a PM who will meet with the premiers. What happened? The right honorable prime minister. While the Conservative leader continues with his misinformation and disinformation, the reality is the Parliamentary Budget, budget Officer uh, said that 8 out of 10 Canadians do better with our price on pollution and the Canada carbon rebate. But speaking of misinformation and disinformation, any responsible leader uh, that receives an endorsement and support from proven conspiracy theorist and liar Alex Jones would have immediately denounced that. But that's not what the Leader of the Opposition did. He did absolutely nothing because those kinds of endorsements fit within his political strategy. The Honourable Member for Belleau Chambly. Mr. And no response from Polyev. Yeah. All right. So let's go through a couple of things. We'll save the Alex Jones things for last because that's just, that's the whole thing on its own. Yeah. Um, this is the guy that was part of a government for 10 years that did not meet with premiers not once Stephen Harper had some a whole for those of us who are younger here there was a time where several times a year or at least once a year the prime minister would meet with all the premiers at once so they had a federal fed prof meeting because and these things usually never went well for the federal government because it was 13 ganged up against one and mm -hmm. you know like this and you know, each one stands up for their clip or their little scrum for the press conference, and you've got 13 people saying that the government is evil with one person saying, uh, well, actually, we're not that evil. So we're like and then the prime minister standing up going, I'm not Satan. <clears throat> right? Regardless of party stripe, that's how these things go. So Stephen Harper, who didn't like any media scrutiny whatsoever, he's the one that uh, decided that us as Canadians were entitled only to get uh, five questions from him. 
uh, answers to five questions. Um, uh, didn't like this type of, uh, Stephen Harper didn't like any type of embarrassment whatsoever. No, let's put it that way. So he said, well, these types of meetings don't work for me, so I'm just not going to meet with them anymore. And then just never had another one called of those meetings. Garbage. Right. Um, and this is sort of in the same vein as like the, the budgetary pre announcements, right? Before there was time people that were locked up and the budget would get a lot of coverage. It would be, you know, they'd keep on covering the budget for a whole week or something like that afterwards. And, and now it's sort of like, oh, you know, the budget was released uh, around the same time as the SNC scandal is. And then the newspapers go, oh, well, oh, yeah, yesterday there was a budget. Uh, uh, we're going to, it's not balanced again. And uh, there's going to be this much deficit. Now about SNC. Yeah. And then we forget all the messages. So this time the, the government is doing a pre budget tour, which has the conservatives like, screaming bloody murder because they didn't think of it first mm -hmm. uh and because <laughs> they're essentially they're just doing with the budget before the budget is announced what the conservatives did with the economic action plan putting up all those signs and all those commercials after it was announced right they're just trying to get the maximum bang for their buck but it's a new tradition that's being uh, created because everybody is now saying my god it's brilliant and i can't imagine any other government in the future would not do this now so um, we can expect this to become a new trend. Well, this is the same thing as well. Stephen Harper decided to start a new trend. He was just no longer going to have these types of meetings that would mm -hmm. cause him some embarrassment. So the prime minister came in and he did have a couple of these meetings. You know, he had a, there was a first meeting on healthcare and there was some meetings to talk about uh, topping up the CPP to make it solvent for the next generation. And mm -hmm. then there was the uh, augmentation of the Canada child benefit. And then there was a meeting. There was a meeting on carbon regulation. Now, it was eight years ago and there was a different set of premiers because at that time, not all the provinces had flipped blue yet. Um, but the government of Canada made a deal with the governments of the provinces and the territories, regardless of stripe at the time, to put this into place. So, and since then, the prime minister has indeed met with premiers, but not all together all at once. The same thing that the prime minister that came before, who was this guy's boss and still is this guy's boss, because let's be honest, Stephen Harper is still the leader of the Conservative Party of Canada, just from Hungary or wherever it is the idea of headquarters is. Um, but he's doing it by proxy, let's be honest. So we're in a situation where this guy here, Pierre Polyev, is standing in the House of Commons and misrepresenting that the Prime Minister doesn't meet and doesn't talk to the Premiers and that the Premiers somehow have not been heard and that this has never been talked about or discussed. And we need an emergency carbon tax meeting. And it has to be now. And not only does it have to be now, it has to be televised because, well, you know, PP is so, so sure that if the Prime Minister gets in a room with those 13 premiers that there are cameras on there, that the Prime Minister is going to be, well, it's going to be a telethon of embarrassment for the Prime Minister. Uh, here's the thing, though. Uh, the Prime Minister has neither said yes or no to this at the moment. He's just basically said, uh, we have already had a meeting on this. We've already had elections on this. There seems to be growing buzz in the analyst community and even a couple of people within uh, the party thinking that maybe the prime minister should be going for it at this time because he does have the advantage here in that he has asked all these premiers to come up with a solution first. And a lot of them have decided that they're not going to. And this type of meeting, yes, it would have X number of premiers, especially six of them in particular, trying to lambaste the, the government, the federal government, and you know, calling it evil and uncaring and heartless and all that kind of stuff, charging a new tax right now at this time, particular time as we're raising our gas tax, which, um, especially if you're in Alberta, or as I imposed uh, more provincial sales taxes, as was the case of Saskatchewan, mm -hmm. Premier Scott Moe actually raised taxes. Yes, he did. Like, not too long ago. Right? Um, and instituted, uh, I also added electricity to his uh, hidden carbon tax that he actually put in place in 2019 and never reported as a line item on the budget until last year when he Somebody had to add electricity to it to pretend that 
to people from Saskatchewan that he was no longer collecting the carbon fee, but so he would still have the money to pay it to the federal government. So, you know, he didn't have to find the money somewhere else. Uh, but, you know, he never reported the previous carbon tax because it was only $25 million until he had to add 323 more million to it per year because of electricity. Then he kind of sort of had to write it somewhere. Because I guess it's easier to hide $25 million than it is to hide 300 and. 48 i guess i guess who knows but he would be in a situation uh, like i could sort of see a scenario if they were all sitting around the table and he was sitting at uh, at one pen like around this round table mm -hmm. and the camera was going to him and he was asking premiers questions and question premiers were answering he says okay but yes but what about this what about this well have you done this well i've given you this opportunity so what is your plan this well this plan has to be at least equivalent to what ours accomplishes so this you have a plan and you've said you're going to do alternative things but these alternative things don't meet this threshold mm -hmm. so you have to do i'm not sure it would be entirely embarrassing for the prime minister i mean danielle smith would do her best and scott but would do her best to call him this and that and every other thing and of course. Like make the case that he's trying to destroy albertans lives but um this would actually be a dialogue, not a monologue. And if they tried to run roughshod over him, there would be cameras on. People would see that behavior and certainly would not take to it. So I'm not actually, I'm not actually sure that Pierre would be happy with the result if he got precisely that for which it is he is asking with that smug smarm on his face. Not know if the prime minister is going to do it or not, mm. but a lot of people, including the natural resources minister, John Wilkinson, have sort of been hinting that they don't think it's necessarily a bad idea. Well, I'm just saying. Mm. Now, um, the other comments that he kind is kind of to make uh, he's trying to make is um well he actually said this specifically because this was an opposition day motion so he's using yet another one for carbon stuff and motion called quote for the pm to quote convene a carbon tax emergency meeting one in which the pm would let the premiers opt out to pursue other responsible ideas to lower emissions that's already the policy. Mm -hmm. That's literally already the law. The law allows the premiers to opt out using other responsible ideas to lower emissions. So long as they meet the federal threshold, so long as they achieve a result that is equivalent to what the carbon backstop would achieve notice that part is not in his motion when he says pursue other responsible ideas to lower emissions pierre polyev doesn't ask for those other allegedly responsible between skippy air quotes ideas mm. to be ideas that reach a result that is similar or better than that which the federal backstop would achieve. So Pierre is just like, hey, premiers, just come up and say, hey, we're going to do this. And the federal government should just say, well, great, do that, without checking whether what it is they propose to do would actually have any results. Just take their word for it. Just like Scott Moe said in testimony, we don't need rules for corporations and big emitters. Just trust them to do it. Yeah, that, that'll work out well, right? We don't need rules or to check on conservative, ideologically conservative premiers who have spent the last eight years saying that this is essentially the tool of Satan to make you lose your home. Ah, we don't need to check whether or not what they propose will actually meet the goal. Just trust them. It'll be fine. Don't worry It'll about it. It'll be fine. As Alberta's burning. 
this is fine. That's <laughs> like, I was just like, oh, man, I can't believe this guy. So, uh, and then, of course, it's like, why doesn't he have the courage to sit down in a televised and open forum and have a carbon tax conference with the premiers? Why doesn't he have the courage? Again, about? Are, are we on the schoolyard? It's like, why won't you meet with the premiers? What are you? Chicken? <laughs> like, that's going to get a prime. Like, have you said, there's a style of comments goes, what are we, three? Well, he certainly behaves in that manner. I'm just. <laughs> It's the same thing where they're going like this. Why is the prime minister? If the prime minister really believes in his carbon tax, he'll call an election now. What are you, chicken? I triple dog dare you with maple syrup on top. It's like, again, what are we? It's three? Just absurd. It's like, you don't get an election just because you want one. Well, you, you don't get a minister's conference just because you ask the prime minister, are you a chicken? You probably have. He's, a, he's been spoon fed anything he's wanted his entire life. Oh my God. So he figures he should just get what he wants. This guy, could you imagine him on the international scene? Well, I'm going to. What's the matter, him. Vladimir? Are you afraid of NATO? Ooh. I'm going to ask my <laughs> well, buddy. Of course, he would never say that. Because my buddy went to, to, to high school and university with him, and I'm going to ask him, how many swirlies did he get? <laughs> Purple nurples. How many locker stuffings? Like, I mean, come on. Here's uh, the thing, though. This is what you need to understand. This is who he was in high school and university. He's not changed a bit. Who no. you see in the House of Commons, and that's exactly who he is. He peaked in high school. And he's never, he's never changed. And I've heard this from a number of people who went to university and high school with him. Yep. And it's still working good enough for him. Why he's like, you know the concept of the Peter principle? Mm -hmm. He's literally reaching his Pierre principle. Yeah. Um, so Natural Resources Minister Jonathan Wilkinson said, the premiers need to come up with a reasonable alternative if they want a conversation. But they have no plan. So there'll be no conversation, really. right? <laughs> so, but he's basically says, yeah, well, you want a conversation, come up with a plan. Let's talk about your plans. Rather than just talking about existence of carbon pricing, yes or no. Let's talk about your plans. Show us a plan. We'll talk. But they don't want to develop a plan. They don't want to do the work. And Mark Carney... Very interesting, because we all we all very heavily suspect that when the prime minister decides that he's going to take, a, well, he probably won't take a walk on the snow. He'll probably take a surf in Tofino. Um, I don't think he's going to do it either, to be honest. With you. But when he does, eventually he oh, will. Oh, eventually, yes. Eventually he will, because it's not like Mark Carney is like sitting there and raising a campaign to push him out. Yeah. It, it's not like Christian Turner back days right or no no or martin martin critzian as well um but no, it's not like that at all actually but uh, mark carney is like literally said you know it's just every now and then it's like you i'm here yeah. when the time comes i'll be interested <laughs> but uh, he went on the record saying yeah the meeting should happen this is the former governor of the bank of canada and bank of england mm -hmm. the current u.n special envoy on climate action and finance well, the guy who guided us through the 2008 world uh, financial crisis. Yes. But the guy who would be able to definitely make the case with credibility that putting money yes. into fighting, into reducing GHG reductions is actually sound financial policy. Mm -hmm. Well, how many economists? Speaking as the former hey. governor of the Bank of Canada, Bank of England, and the UN Special Envoy on Climate Action and Finance. I say this is a good thing. <laughs> Beat that. Well, I'm, 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 quoting, I'm quoting this book. Uh, do you know, oh. Are you familiar with this book? Yeah, I wrote it. Yes, exactly. Um, Allow me to quote myself. Yes. <laughs> Allow myself to quote myself. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, he's basically saying if the premiers want to take the policy out, they need to replace it with something at least as effective. And they don't have anything because they don't want to be as effective. So that's why there's, there seems to be, don't be surprised mm -hmm. if such a meeting actually does happen in some way or for, shape or form. 
Well, speaking of banking, uh, just side side note, there's a really good, because you're talking about the Bank of England that he was the head of, the only foreigner to ever hold that position, by the yes. way. Uh, there's, a, there's a really good film on Netflix called The Bank of Dave. If you get a chance, give it a watch. It's based on a true story. Uh, it's, it's, it's a really heartwarming true story about a good person trying to do good for their community and ends up winning in a roundabout way in the end. Okay. And it's about banking in England. Cool. Now, the last bit, which is the Alex Jones stuff, which mm -hmm. clearly is the sensational stuff. Um, Alex Jones put out a tweet. So somebody... Glenda McFarlane put out a tweet with Pierre in front of a bunch of mics talking. Said, this is why Pierre will become our next prime minister. And then Alex Jones retweeted that saying, been following this guy for years and he is the real deal. Canada desperately needs a lot more leaders like him and so does the rest of the world. Okay, number one, Alex Jones probably hasn't been following this guy for years. You probably heard about him on Rogan or something like this yeah. and then decided to, okay. Yeah. People have doctored that tweet. Oh, in many ways. So I've been, I guess, I've been donating. And, and for removed years. the follow oh. following. Yeah, I've been donating for years, which, like, everybody says, like, well, how's he been donating? It was like, he's not even a Canadian citizen. So, but the actual tweet is the been following this guy for years. Um, Jones apparently made the comment while reposting, well, uh, reposting. He was, the clip was showing Pierre, uh, sorry, Justin, sorry. Pierre calling Justin Trudeau illiberal at a Brampton, Ontario press conference. He quotes saying, liberals used to believe in liberty and conservatives believed in conserving it. Probably have said in the clip, that was the common sense consensus we had in Canada. Well, okay, well, liberals still believe in liberty, but conservatives no longer believe in conserving it. So, I mean, that's the thing that's changed, Pierre. Um, and then he goes on to a whole bunch of stuff. He wants to control your money, your kids, blah, 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 where, you know, Pierre's the one that's saying you know, which events you can go to and can't once he becomes leader and all that kind of stuff. So, but with regard to Alex Jones, we do not follow the individual you mention or listen to what he says, a spokesperson for the Polyev told the True North. Common sense conservatives are listening to the priorities of the millions of Canadians that want to ax the tax, build the homes, fix the budget, stop the crime, but yeah, punt the runt. <laughs> <laughs> That's been it is, a lot lately. Yes, yes, yeah. Scrap the crap. It is the endorsement of hardworking everyday Canadians that conservatives are working to earn. So here's the thing, kids and cubs. When uh, somebody denies or tries to back away, so clearly they're trying to back away from this endorsement. Pierre Polyev knows enough to know that in Canada, getting Alex Jones's endorsement. And for those who may have forgotten, Alex Jones is the guy that said that the Sandy Hook was a false flag. Nobody was actually shot. They were actors. It was all. Yeah. Yeah. And he and got sued for what? Sued, a billion dollars? Uh, a lot. Yeah, I think definitely in the billion. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. There's, there's definitely a B in that number. Um, so, you know, all around quality guy guy you would want on your side, right? Mm -hmm. Clearly, Pierre doesn't want to. But here's the thing. We do not follow the individual you mention. I'm Anything. having a Destiny's Child moment. Say his name, say his name. If you're gonna denounce him, you gotta name him. <laughs> so, um, when somebody says, we do not follow the individual and doesn't even want to say the name yeah. of that individual, that's very telling. Right? When and they say, question. we refer to them as that person, that individual, rather than the name, you know, it's a lie. Oh. Because going that far out of your way to not say that individual's name means you follow those who follow said that individual and you're courting their support. Because if he really didn't want the support of Canadians who also support Alex Jones, he would say, we do not follow Alex Jones and we do not listen to what he says. But he instead say they that. say, we do not follow the individual you mentioned or listen to what he says. Let's but we know he listens to, to what he says because both of them are MGTOW. Yeah. Yeah. It's just like they never say China. They say Beijing. 
They never say China. Yeah. It's they won't they won't admit to their own mistakes, their own faults. Look at this though. I just typed in Alex Jones into the Twitter search bar, and look the first three people that come up: Alex Jones, Alex Jones, I guess a musician or modeling, and yeah. Pierre Polyev. <laughs> I know. I know. I mean, Twinsies. Mm-hmm. So I do not follow that individual. It's not really a denunciation if you don't name them. Oh, and then of course this this if individual. You, if you if you're gonna bounce and denounce, you got a name. Well, and then you've got this person. Uh, she's got to got to drudge this one up again. Ugh. Do you want to read it? I don't. Uh, 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 okay. Yeah, you got some people going. See, here's the thing. I am going to read it because if you need to go there, yeah, you're revealing, you're confessing. So, so Cat Canada. Blue check mark. Mm -hmm. What is more problematic for you? The fact that Alex Jones endorsed Pierre Polyev or the fact that Trudeau and his ilk celebrated an actual real life Nazi? That hunk of guy in yeah. the, that came in, that, that was in the, the, the gallery of the House of Commons. Here. Okay. If you need, first of all, it's already been well established that nobody applauded for a Nazi that day. No. Everybody applauded for the, who they thought was a war hero. And Pierre Padiev also applied, applauded that day, although very unenthusiastically when he thought he was applauding a war hero. Okay. But he did stand up and applaud. Every person. All in the of them yeah. did. Okay. So, but here's it again. Oh my God. Alex Jones is so terrible, and I know that, that the only way I can try to change the channel and denounce this is by yelling, Nazi! Rolling That's the it. dice. That's it. Nazi! That's all I got. Got all fives. <laughs> I yelled a Nazi. Uh, I don't... I, yeah, yeah. Exactly. It's dumb. Well, and James is... It's mad. outright dumb. But that's a sign that the only thing worse than Alex Jones, what they needed to play to trump him, mm -hmm. was an alleged Nazi. And again, invited by the Speaker, not the Prime Minister, it was the Speaker of the House who stepped down when they found yep. out. And again, every member of Parliament stood and applauded him. Everyone. Everyone. No exceptions. Including your cult leader hero, Pierre Polyev, who did it unenthusiastically, but he also did the same thing for um, Zelensky, Vladimir yes. Zelensky, just oh, because he's yay. Putin's puppet. He's Putin's right. puppet. Come on. Yep. So, exactly. Kid James has got it right. Bringing that guy was a sloppy, stupid mistake, but not an endorsement of Nazism. Not so even close. Had the had the speaker stood up and said, this guy supported the Nazis and everybody got up and applauded, then she would have a point. Yeah. But they were speaking of him and representing him as being a war hero who stood up to, I think it was Stalin the other time, who was trying to starve Ukrainians. Completely different thing. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Uh, so, Alex Jones has made an appearance. Again, it's the company you keep. And we know, we know that the Conservative Party of Canada and Pierre Polyev and Jenny Byrne and friends and Andrew Lawton from True North Center, we know that all of them are aware enough mm -hmm. that Alex Jones is so toxic that they need to distance themselves with him from him without saying his name. Yeah. 
but they'll take the donations though. Well, and you know they're you know they're grifting off of this. Oh yeah, conservative again. Conservatives always say no, 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 but they always take the dough. Let's change the dichotomy here. These are not conservatives. These are not conservatives. They're not. They're These, reformers. Yeah. These are not conservatives. They're conservative in name only. They are not conservatives. They are not progressive. And and it's what, not what, even in name only. It's just in brand only. In brand only. You're right. What was it? Uh, uh, Aaron O'Toole said social conservatives, and I was like, social conservatives. That doesn't sound good. That doesn't sound good at all. That kind of sounds like an organization that wears white hoods. Just saying. Yeah. I mean, social conservative? One could argue that the KKK was a social conservative organization. Well, tell me that they're not. You had to look and fit into this category of human being to be a member of that organization. Social conservative. That's mm -hmm. how I see it. The yeah. moment I heard those words out of his mouth, I was like, oh, that's, that's really, that's really bad. Progressive conservative, fiscal conservative. I can accept those. But when you say social conservative, you are a reformer through and through. You are not conservative in any way, shape or form. You are mm. bad for democracy, bad for Canada, bad for Canadians. Period. That's Indeed. it. Indeed. Indeed. Um, other news that is uh going on over here um uh the government uh, uh prime minister uh, as part of the budget pre-tour uh, i think was a uh, minister of uh, freeland that when announced a 500 million dollar fund for uh youth mental health mm -hmm. um minister uh as mental health minister really as the words were coming out of your mouth yes <laughs> uh minister for mental health and addictions yara Sachs, said that schools closures social isolation and uncertainty about the future took a real toll on our youth and their mental health mark holland says that uh, the money will flow directly to community organizations rather than going through the premiers mm. <clears throat> so we'll see what happens uh with that uh the, i did watch a great interview on power and politics yesterday with uh yara Sachs, the minister um I was very impressed uh, with her knowledge of the file and her ability to speak of uh, the subject of uh, youth mental health and stuff. And uh, I will hopefully be isolating a clip and uh, bringing it to the show in a couple of days. Uh, so uh, I haven't had a chance to reach much, read much on this announcement. Uh, so all I have is the, the the big line. But I would I usually like to try to pre present to you the large outline and then a little bit of detail, which I don't have today for you on this specifically, but uh, I have been taking notes on it and I will have something a little more. Uh, but if you uh, want to see it before we bring it to you, um, please do check out Power and Politics yesterday, the interview uh, between David Cochran and uh, Yara Sachs on this. Uh, she was quite impressive. Um, so that's, uh, but that was the, the latest announcement uh, on the tour. Uh, going on at the moment. Um, what else is there? My, my notes are a little out of order, unfortunately. Um, there was a big decision yesterday uh, that's not Canada-based, uh, but could apply uh, or influence uh, things in Canada uh, going on. Um, Three different groups brought court cases to the European Courts of Human Rights uh, with regards to climate change. And um, they basically um, are going after their governments because they're not doing what needs to be done to fight climate change. So you have a group of Portuguese teens and young adults that claim that their right to life, to family, and freedom from mental or physical torture has been infringed upon by multiple years of extreme heat and wildfires. Then you have a group of senior Swiss women who claim that inadequate climate policies have put them at higher risk for temperature-related mortality. And finally, you have a French mayor who says that rising sea levels threaten to swallow his town. Now, yesterday, there was a decision that came out with regard to the case of the Swiss women. 
and they ruled that countries have a legal obligation to protect their citizens from the effects of climate change. So 2,000 elderly Swiss women got the court to agree that Switzerland's efforts to meet its emissions targets were sorely lacking. For example, they did not set a national emissions cap or standard and put them at risk of an early heat-related death. And uh, they're saying that this is a very important legal precedent that could affect 46 other countries uh, related uh, sort of in the EU sort of general area, as well as several countries in the EU where there are such legal cases being heard or filed at the moment, such as the Netherlands, the Spains, and Italy. And there are cases like this in the United States and Canada as well. Lucy Maxwell, the co-director of Climate Litigation Network, says, quote, it affirms the European Convention on Human Rights applies to the climate crisis, that governments have legal duties to act, and they've upheld the right of people to go to court and challenge their government's weak climate action. And this court's rulings are legally binding. Uh, the co-president of Les Aînés pour le Climat, Anne Marère, said in French, Notre pays ne fait pas ce qu'il devrait faire. Il est clairement en dessous des objectifs écrits dans l'accord de Paris et la Cour constate un certain nombre de violations concernant nos droits fondamentaux et que donc maintenant, il doit absolument avoir des ambitions beaucoup plus importantes en termes climatiques. Which essentially translates into English in, as Our country doesn't do what it should be doing. It is clearly under... Uh, or below the objectives that were written down in the Paris Accord. And the court has uh, ruled that a certain number of violations of our fundamental rights have taken place. And therefore now it must absolutely have way more important ambitions, significant ambitions when it comes to climate change. The court leaves the nation of Switzerland the freedom to choose the methods it will use, but imposes upon it the requirement of setting precise national carbon targets for GHG emissions reductions and putting in place a tracking mechanism to ensure the targets are met. Now, uh, Marc Bichay, who's a lawyer from the Centre Québécois du droit de l'environnement, so translated to the Quebec Centre for Environmental Law, uh, has on record as saying, Même si les jugements étrangers n'ont pas la force de précédent devant nos tribunaux, ils peuvent quand même être utilisés pour leur force persuasive, par exemple pour assurer les juges qui ne seraient pas des pionniers qu'il y a déjà de leurs collègues ailleurs dans les pays avec des systèmes de justice similaires qui ont déjà rendu des jugements comme celui-ci. Which means, even if foreign judgments, judicial decisions, don't have the force of precedent before our courts, they can still be used for the persuasive power for example, to reassure judges that don't consider themselves as being pioneers, that there are others among their colleagues in other countries with similar justice systems that have already rendered judgments such as these, so they won't be sticking their necks out. Uh, Nikki Ritchie, who is the director for the Center for International Environmental Law, says, we can't overstate the significance of this decision. What it does signal is that judges, including in Canada, are on solid ground to find that failure to do more in Canada to curb emissions urgently as an important precedent. The hope in bringing in litigation like this is that it will spark change. So this is very, 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 very big. This is earth shattering. Mm -hmm. Seismic legal news, and it will definitely have repercussions. So, and it, once again, it puts Pierre Poliev in a very, very difficult situation because, again, if I was a member of the press, I'd be going there with my microphone saying, "Hey, the European Court on Human Rights just just ruled that countries that don't do it enough or don't have a serious enough climate plan are in violation of international law." Yeah, and are in violation. Well, not only violation of international law, except no, not, not exactly violation of international law in this case. In this case, it would be violation of domestic law with regard to respecting the human rights of your own citizens. Because well, how do you respond to that? The I would love to see that. Moment. Remember when he said, "Once I'm prime minister, I will axe that tax so fast your head will spin." Uh, yeah. You do realize the load of crap you will get us into if you do that. Are all of our trade agreements with countries, with every country in Europe, will be null and void in a moment? Period. Yeah. Like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know. I know. <laughs> it's. Just, um. So what'll happen is let's let's say. Let's say he becomes the prime minister. 
let's say that was to happen. I'm going to ax the tax, ax the tax, ax the tax, get in. If you ax the tax, you're going to null, you're going to kill all our trade deals with every country in Europe. Every single one. All of a sudden, we'll have the same sort of backpedaling we got from uh, Gretchen when he said he was going to ax the GST. Oh, I, I can't do that now. Yeah, no, you can't. And he wouldn't because of the load of crap it would pile onto us and the amount of billions of money, billions of dollars that would be lost in trade deals, not to mention the jobs, the job marketing across this country that would be decimated by this. I'm going to ax a three cent per liter increase in your taxes for fuel that 80% of the citizenry get more money back than they pay into it. I'm going to get rid of that. And now you don't have a job because all of our trade deals with basically Europe are null and void. Yeah. I mean, come on. <laughs> I just, I just don't. Some I know. Days, some I know. I know. I know. It's just, it's beyond ridiculous. Yeah. Beyond ridiculous. Um, I don't know how much more time we have, Mr. Grizzly. About 10 minutes. Okay. Um, so a couple of quick hits then. Um, uh, a couple of days ago. Um, yeah, actually, I'm not quite sure on the facts on that one. So I'm going to skip the skip mm. that. Actually, I'll save it for another day to make sure I'm giving you the, the proper facts on this one, because I do, I do not want to lead anybody in error. Um, another international, uh, something that happens somewhere else in the world that could have an impact on political discussion here is that uh, yesterday in the United States, in the state of Arizona, um, there was a decision by the court that, um, well, let's put it this way. When people say, make America great again, mm -hmm. I guess, or take America back, or take back Canada, or take back Alberta, right? The questions always are, when was America great, ever great? Yes. Like this, take, a, take America back to when? To when, yeah. yeah. Right? We don't know. We always thought, oh, maybe 1950s, right? Some people thought, you know, with the sort of uh, flirtation with white supremacy, well, maybe 1934. Uh, turns out the answer to that question is 1864. Kits and cubs. Yeah. Because in Arizona, the state Supreme Court in a 4-2 ruling said that it should follow the law on abortion that existed at that time, 1864, rather than the up to 15-week rule that had been set just in December 2022 by a lower court mm -hmm. that already was more restrictive than the law that existed before. So this uh, lower court interpretation saying that it was should be a 15 week and then ban was cast aside for two by the Supreme Court and uh, for this 1864 law instead that was still on the books that bans abortions in all cases with no exception for rape or incest but with an exemption in case of the patient the patient's life's at risk and it makes performing an abortion a crime punishable by two to five years in prison yay now this is one of the reasons for which it is very important whenever I hear the government of Canada say that they're going to be passing a law to basically, because they went through the criminal code and they found some old laws that were nobody's ever used in over 100 years and they're going to remove them off the books. And everybody goes, oh, why are you wasting time with that? That's such a waste of time. We could be doing other stuff. And this is why it's important. Because when the Supreme Court decides to go rogue and overturn a precedent, Roe versus Wade, when those old laws or zombie laws because when Roe versus Wade came into effect, it was national. So it made a whole bunch of state laws on abortion obsolete that superseded those laws. Those laws could not be applied anymore. But the state governments did not go in and say, oh, well, since we can't use this law anymore, we're going to take it off the books. They just left it there. Now Roe's been overturned. Oh, well, guess what? That old law from 1864 is still there. So let's apply 1864 law in 2024. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's why it's always important for legislators to do the housekeeping work of going into the criminal code and removing the old laws that we haven't used so that somebody can't come back X number of years ago later 
and make them apply. By the way, that's how Jacques Chrétien got Conrad Black for his Lord thing. It was an old 18-something law, 1800-something law that was still in the books in Canada. He turned around and says, no, you can't do that because there was a, something have to do with nickel or whatever. Uh, but he basically he used a zombie law. It was on the book to deny Lord Black his peership. So, or at least Canadian support for his peership and made it so that Lord Black had to sort of declare that he was not Canadian anymore in order to get his title. <laughs> so, yeah, this is a very concerning. Uh, an effort is already underway to put abortion on the state ballot in order to enshrine that right in the state's constitution time for the next federal election, and the groups say that they already have the signatures for that. Arizona Governor Katie Hobbs says, quote, These extreme legislators sent a fatal personhood bill to my desk that I was able to veto last year. This is a bill that would have paved the way for an Alabama style ruling that would ban IVF in Arizona. They're going after contraception. This doesn't stop at abortion. And the Attorney General of Arizona, Chris Mays, is on the record as saying, no doctor or woman will be prosecuted under this draconian law, not on my watch. So she's basically not going to enforce it. White House Press Secretary Karen Jean-Pierre says there are now 21 extreme state abortion bans in effect all across the country in the United States. One third of all women living in the United States who are of reproductive age live in a state with an abortion ban. Uh, there's a two-week stay on this decision to give time for uh, challenges to it in lower courts, to uh, including on its constitutionality to be uh, put in. But uh, essentially, in two weeks, if there isn't uh, more delays, uh, everybody in Arizona, uh, women of reproductive age, will not be able to access abortion unless their life is at risk. Personally. Did you remember what else was um, legal in 1864? Mm hmm yeah. They had a war about it. Yeah. And it was not about states' rights. Yeah. It was about yeah. the ability to own human beings. Yeah. People who look like me. Uh, yeah. 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 So we're they want to go back. We're having the best time. Times. Yeah. You know, back when, back when the average age of, of a person was what? You live to be 50? And 50 was considered old? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, All and, of them can just go to hell. Yeah. All of them. Yeah. All of them. Yeah. And another U.S. decision which might have an impact on Canada is that uh, President Biden has uh, decided to set the first national standards to limit forever chemicals in drinking water. Water utilities will have to filter out five types of BFAs or forever chemicals that are used to help products repel water or oil. But these products also uh, linger in the environment and in the human body. And they are linked to problems such as cancer, thyroid disease, and organ damage. The CDC in the state says that they are found in the blood of nearly every American. So if uh, there is going to be uh, this type of law in the United States. These are the types of things that usually the Canadian government follows a couple of months or years later. Um, but uh, uh, again, you know, important le legal trends going on in other nations with regard to uh, cleaning up the environment will definitely uh, be referred to and pointed out uh, by Canadian politicians who want to go harder and faster on uh, making sure that we're doing right uh, by the environment and reducing our GHGs. So uh, when uh, decisions like this come around in other places uh, in the world, particularly uh, in the United States, because the conservative policy appears to typically be, well, there's no point in us doing it until the United States does, because we're just going to destroy our economy. Then when the United States does it, then they try to find another reason to get it. But their first reason is usually, well, if the United States is not doing it, or China is not doing it, or India is not doing it, why should we? So, in this case, the United States is doing it. So, stay tuned. There may be similar uh, measures announced here. A uh, couple of uh, rest in pieces before we uh, close out the show. Uh, Speaker John Fraser, former House Speaker John Fraser, uh, died 
at the age of 92. Uh, he was first elected in 1972. He was a Vancouver uh, conservative MP, progressive conservative at the time. He was the first speaker elected by secret ballot and served as speaker from 1986 to 1993. He also served as Minister of the Environment and Fisheries of Oceans uh, and uh, was the subject of scandal. He needed to resign in 1995 as a result of the tainted tuna affair for those of mm. those us older enough to remember that um as i do recall as, that yeah. probably as the minister of fisheries and oceans at the time he ordered large quantities of tuna to be sold to the public even though it had been deemed unfit for human consumption shades of listeriosis and walker too. um yes it seems that uh the tradition of conservatives making sure that what it is that we put in our bodies is actually good for us uh, and failing at that um, is a longstanding conservative tradition. Didn't start with just Walkerton. So there you go. That was in uh, 1995, uh, the tainted tuna thing. And also RIP to Nobel Prize winner in physics, Peter Higgs, who died at the age of 94. Uh, I believe he uh, shared the 2013 Nobel Prize in physics. He was the person who proposed the existence of the Higgs boson particle back in 1964, yes. or the God particle, which sort of explained how the universe formed uh, the after bang. the Big Bang. And uh, between the time that he proposed it and the time that his theory was actually proven, uh, about 50 years took place. And uh, the existence of the God particle was confirmed at the Large Hadron Collider finally, uh, not too long ago. At CERN in Switzerland and France. Exactly. All right. That's the end of this episode of the Daily Beaver Morning Show, Kids and Cups. We hope that you enjoyed listening to us because we loved making this for you. Uh, remember, sharing is caring and word of mouth is priceless, so please tell your peeps and poops all about us because we love it when you do our marketing for us. It means that much more because what you have to say matters. If you would like to make sure that you do not miss an episode, you don't have to, thanks to The Ray Girl, because she sponsored our pod page. Podpage.com slash the true north eager beaver, lowercase letters with a hyphen between each one of those words. And when you go there and click subscribe, when we have something fresh off the bandwidth, it will come directly to you. And I'm sure at some point, Mr. Grizzly will make the QR code appear underneath my chin for people watching, if you would like to scan that. If you would like to support us in other ways, you can go to the true north eager beaver media incorporated youtube page and make like kit elaine and smash those buttons like share subscribe it makes us so happy when you do that it makes us just a little warm fuzzy inside so uh please go there we appreciate that very much and as you can see the qr code has now appeared so if you would like to scan that to go to our pod page and if you would like to help us in other ways well there's the emergency hydration fund of Beaver Lodge, and you can find that at our coffee page. That's coffee, ko ficom slash eager beaver, lowercase letters, all in one word. Or if you scan that QR code that's right by Mr. Grizzly's head, that will take you directly there. If you have a couple of toonies uh, making a little noise in your pockets and uh, you would like to encourage us to do more because you enjoy this product or you just like us, um, you find us cute and, car cute and charming. As I pat my eyelashes. Um, <laughs> hey, I am not proud. <laughs> I'll have to go in and cut out the long silent there before. <laughs> it's fine in the visual medium, but the audio medium is like, oh, yeah. what I'll happened? You just disappeared. <laughs> um, but yes, if you would like to uh, make sure, uh, buy us a coffee to thank us uh, for what it is that uh, we do or to encourage us to do more of it or keep at it, we would be very grateful. So uh, please get that QR code and uh, donate whatever you can. Thank you so much. And if you can't donate, that's fine because the gift of your attention and when you retweet us and when you interact on the chat and when you respond to our tweets and provide us some comments or send us some articles or tips on new stuff that you think we should cover, all of that is extremely helpful to us. And we are very grateful for everything that you do to participate in making the show because it's your show too, not just ours. So thank you very much. If you would like to write to us, true north eager beaver at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. And, uh, uh, there's another thing I usually say after that. Oh, yes. If you're listening to us on Apple Podcasts, stars and reviews. Thank you so much. We really do appreciate them. Um, <laughs> because democracy is something that you do, please write those letters to your MPs, your MPPs, your MLAs, your senators, and the members. Yes. And um, 
there's this thing that's uh, well, actually, I will save it for the Easter egg. But there's a a recommendation for something that you can send specifically if you happen to be living in Ontario going uh, going around. Uh, and yes, I think it deserves to be point. amplified a little bit, so we'll yeah. bring that to you. From the Beaver Lodge, this is your eager beaver saying, it could be a tough world out there, kids, so please be kind too and gentle with yourself. And uh, yes, as Kit Saucy says, spell six break outside, the sweet, fresh smell. So uh, if you have a time uh, and you're on a walk one day and uh, today and you happen to see some flowers, Take some time to stop and smell the flowers. Unless you're like me and you have severe allergies and you yes, then don't do that. Off. Don't do that. that. Don't do that. Don't do that. But if you you see some crocus out there, uh, well, just stick your nose in there and give it a little sniff. I was give a, yourself a little happy. I was a, a doing tech support for a meeting about mental health in the workplace and this and that, and, and they showed a picture of a field of flowers, and they said, "What's the first thing when you think of this?" And I just kept my mouth shut, and about a dozen people. I'm going to sneeze my head off. I'm going to run in the opposite direction. And, and literally, and I said, that was the first thing I thought. So the, the person who put the seminar together said, maybe I'll change that image to something else. <laughs> yes. Clarendon. <laughs> oh, yes. I can kind of ruined the whole, it's supposed to make you happy and feel uplifted and, and joyful. It's like, no, man, it makes me itchy, watery eyes, sneezy, coffee, wheezy. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm running. Running. <laughs> exactly. Hear the violin stings from Psycho. Yeet, yeet, yeet. I, d- I don't exactly it. have a, a, a words of wisdom <laughs> for you today, but I do have uh, a clip from last night and a question about something. And here's the question. Ooh. So I posted this last night. Canadian folk music legend Ian Tamlin at Meow That's Hot. And it says, content warning. The post officer flagged this as showing sensitive content. No, I did not. <laughs> for- the compass, spend the cobble streets of Basin Park. Tiger running room, now it's deep, swollen rooms, fishing wares, horses who stole the sled on the purple hills. Always the river. I was sent on some exchange to learn the language. I got paid doing dishes in a waterfront cafe. Evenings I would wander home past rocking chairs, hush gallant tones, knitting needles, click a rosary. So it was uh, on uh, on uh, Tuesday nights at uh, at the uh, Meow That's Hot, which is a, a cafe, live music venue, a restaurant, bar, place. They have uh, open mic night. And for open mic night last night, Ian Tamlin was there. And he came up and played Jeez, a song. Nice. And then, and then my lady, she jumped in an Uber and went to the laugh where she performed with Ian Tamblin. No way. Yeah. No way. Yeah, she did. He coat he was so gracious and lovely and he um I can't see you. Come in. He gave sorry, he gave me um he gave me tips on singing and stage fright. <laughs> mhm. And um, anyway, and then I went up with uh, another friend of mine whose name's Ted, and uh, I, I'm hoping he's going to jump in podcast tomorrow. But um, Ted and I did Angel from Montgomery, and Ted is way more experienced than me. I've seen him at Meow yeah, That's Hot a few times. And Ted and I go back over 20 years, and yeah. uh, he he was uh, he used to play lead guitar in a band called they originally called Donkey Punch, and then they changed their name to Saint Joe's Mission. They had to put okay. a couple of records out. And so he was just like, he's like, I got you. And I'm like, I'm, I, I know the words by heart, but if I, if I stumble, he's like, yeah, I got you. So he, I don't want to brag, but he did say I have some chops. <laughs> and, and did, so Angel from Montgomery with Ted on guitar and harmonica and me singing in a very, very, you know, apparently I didn't look nervous, but I certainly was. <laughs> Because and we we waited for a couple of hours to see if we could get on because the the owner is just like maybe maybe not and I'm like but it's Ted <laughs> he's like, he's like I'm like Ted said to tell you that I'm that we're here and he's like all right get on so, oh. well and uh, <laughs> so here's something I was talking to Ted about last night I said uh, so I was hoping we could do our next podcast on the twentieth April twentieth okay. And here's what I was thinking. I was like, well, 
maybe we could do it for Meow That's Hot because okay. they'll, he's Ted and Ian Tamblin are hosting. Uh, they're, it's a whole music adventure thing. So I'll work it out. I'm going to get in touch with Ted later today and see if we can work it out. Maybe we can do a, a live event from there. There's a nice brick wall we can set up in the corner. It'll be a little bit tighter space than normal, but uh, I think it could be interesting. We could have the sure. musical guests come in and chat with us. Sure. You know, the reason I'd be down for that. That yeah. place is, is so cool. Like it's so tiny and it's like, I only found out about it because they, they make this, they make incredible hot sauces. Yes, they do. That they sell. Meow, meow. Meow, that's hot. That's hot. Okay. And then I'm like, I went in to get some hot sauce for my son because he loves that stuff. I'm like, oh, you also have live music? And like, that's awesome. So Thursday night, sorry, Tuesday night is their... um um open mic open mic you have to do two original songs and one cover or 10 minutes or you yeah. have to, so it's uh slow tom i don't know if people know that but from ottawa so i've i've i sang with him before um he does this song called government town anyway i ran into him at uh uh well you have to save that story for thursday okay i'll save it but yeah, i sang just because i gotta i gotta go <laughs> i sang government town with slow tom Nice. Uh, impromptu. I'm like, oh my gosh, you're slow Tom. Like, yeah. I'm, he's like, are you in charge of this event? Because you look like you're in charge. I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm like, but I love you. I love Government Town. So he's like, you want to come sing it with me? I'm like, okay. That's cool. First yeah. time on stage ever. <laughs> uh, slow Tom used to, in a, used to be in a band called Furnace Face. He's been uh, he's been on the Ottawa music scene for decades and he's, he just put out a new record. So yeah, he's pretty, pretty legendary in Ottawa. And of course, Ian Tamblin is a legendary Canadian folk music musician, singer, songwriter, legendary. And I just realized he just turned 76. Mm -hmm. I was like, holy crap. But yeah, I think about it. Yeah. He's 50 years. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if he wasn't, if I wasn't already hooked up, I would have made out with Ian Tamblin last night. He's a very <laughs> handsome and sweet man. You say the same thing about my dad. All right, we got to go. I got to get out of here. I'm going to roll the took credits. a really weird turn. Yes, it did. I'm rolling the credits. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors. The Misfy Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, their uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Pepper Master. Hot pepper sauce is made from farm fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. We are grateful to the Cryer Media Network for its support, Pete Jarvis for our artwork, and Paul Joseph something for our opening and closing sequence music. All right, very, very quickly, Mr. Grizzly, because democracy is something that you do. Um, if you're in Ontario, you might want to send some gravy. <laughs> Doug Ford. <laughs> to Doug Ford. Uh, this is Mr. Otter saying, not saying this is a bad idea at all. Premier Doug Ford, Room 281, Legislative Block, Queens Park, Toronto, Ontario, M7A, 1A1. Uh, chicken gravy? Turkey gravy? Hey. Gravy. Do it. Do it. Do it. <laughs> Peer pressure from the Beaver Lodge. I right. completely, completely agree with that. Uh, send Doug some gravy. All right. I, got, I really got to go. I'll see you. Bye. Bye.